You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Robertson, joined by Billy Grant from the Besotted Bees podcast and Ashley Priest of Birmingham Live. How are you both? Yeah, I'm good, Ashley. How are you doing? Yeah, sound. Uh, the last time we spoke to you, Billy, we just signed Ollie Watkins. Uh, thanks for him, by the way. I don't think he'll play this weekend. How are you finding life in the Premier League? You enjoying it so far? It's been such a journey getting here. It's like one of those ones where we've put the backpack on, like, you know, we'd be trekking halfway around the world for about, you know, kind <laughs> of like, it seems like most of our lives to try and get somewhere waiting for God or whatever like that, you know, and eventually we've actually got to the Premier League. So it was actually more of a buzz getting to the Premier League because we've, you know, losing nine playoff finals out of nine is is quite bad, you know, it is quite bad. You sort of think this is never going to happen. So the fact that we actually got there, and, uh, you know, and River fans were delighted when we got there, like, you know what I'm saying? And we did it at Wembley and the fans were allowed to be in the stadium after the last year and a half of COVID. So all these all these things were sort of slotting into place and we'd lost to Fulham the year before, the F word as well, like, you know, so the fact that we did it the following year and they got relegated, it's like everything was just sort of kind of got a little bit better. So to get to the Premier League was great. And then to have Arsenal you know, drop first game of the season, which is the game that I said that I would love it to be my first game of the season at New Griffin Park, as we call it, because um, we've never, I sort of never visited our ground. You know, we've been, we've been there once, but it didn't really count as a League Cup game and it's a bit rubbish. We took 9,000 fans, the atmosphere is terrible. <laughs> so to be in the ground, like tw- uh, 35 minutes before the game, crowd whipped up, the Hey Jude, you must have seen it on TV, the atmosphere mm-hmm. in that stadium is on, on another level, mate. Tra- <laughs> Listen, the, the 4,500 when we played Bournemouth last season in the playoff semi-final, that sounded like 50,000, but this game, it was just, it was brilliant. And uh, I mean, I, I, I actually only watched it back on the TV about two days ago, and I was watching it back with my daughter, and we were listening to it, and, and the TV commentators were talking, but the funny thing that made me laugh is that you all of a sudden, when, when we were at the Hey Jude, you couldn't actually hear what they were saying. Like mm-hmm. it was, it's hilarious. You literally couldn't hear the commentators what they were saying. I don't know whether or not the microphones weren't turned up right, whatever like that. But <laughs> it was this big dip. But the atmosphere was incredible. So for us to have that atmosphere, to have that day, and then we beat Arsenal as well. You know, it just kind of topped it up. So for me, that was that was just brilliant. So I'll, I'll talk about the Arsenal game. Obviously, we played Crystal Palace afterwards. We we got a clean sheet. It was a tougher game than Arsenal. <laughs> they they were, they were probably tough. They gave us a bit of a kick in to be quite honest, you know. So we got a bit of a beating down of there, but we 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 held firm. And um and the the one thing that we've realised so far is that we seem to be quite hard to beat defensively. We're a mm. lot better than we were last season. Uh, we've got a couple of new players, Chris Asia, um in the defence, playing with Pontus Janssen and Ethan Pinnock, and uh, you know with Rico Henry back. And whoever's on the on the other wing back side, not quite sure who's that going to be. They look to be sort of quite tough. So that's the mainstay of where at the, at the moment now. So answering your question, how's the Premier League at the moment? It's not too bad. Yeah. Well, four, four points in the first two is a great start for a team that I don't know what your aspirations are, but a lot of people will be putting them to be in the bottom three as one of the promoted teams coming up. So four points to start the season is great. For what it's worth, I think they'll stay up. Ash, how have you? A, a kind of assessed Brentford so far. I know it's only been two games, but uh, as Billy was saying, looked good against Arsenal. And we all know, everyone watching this as a Villa fan, how difficult Brentford have been for us since we've played them in the Championship uh, a few yeah. years ago. We haven't beaten them since just after the Second World War in 1946 yeah. at Villa Park. So it's been a, a long time. Um, yeah, I watched that Friday night game uh, against Arsenal. It just reminded me of the Villa Everton game when mm. Villa got their first win back in the Premier League. It was a balmy summer, summer's night. Everyone buzzing and like, the atmosphere was hot. Off the Richter, wasn't it? So yeah, Brentford. I'm buzzing. They're they're back in the they're in the Premier League for the first time. And I mean, oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's game. I think they set up really well. Um, Billy just point um, hovered over it there. Three centre halves: Aya, Pinnock, and Pontus Janssen. They're going to be hard to break down. Danny Ings on his own, probably on his own tomorrow as well. So there's a slight concern. And up the other end, Ivan Tony, goal. He's got goals in him. So I like the way Brentford are lining up this season. Um, I like the manager, Thomas Frank, passionate guy. I like his, his post-match interviews. He laid his heart on his sleeve. So, yeah, I, I can see them having a really good season. That'd be a surprise package for me. And, and yeah, it'd be a tough game for Villa tomorrow. I spoke to Dean Smith today, and we'll talk about um, Frank and Smith with you shortly, Billy. I see this every week, Ash. How was Smith? What was his demeanour like? And, and what's the kind of breaking news from the uh, from the presser this morning? Yeah, I mean, he, he couldn't praise Brentford enough. He absolutely loved his time down there. Can't wait to see some familiar faces tomorrow. Um, but yeah, usual team news, obviously. Assessing Ollie Watkins training about now. Uh, Villa starting training. So, 
he's been struggling with the bruised knee for the last three weeks. So hopefully he'll be involved. If not, it'll be after the international break. No Leon Bailey still. Hamstring issue. He's out. Which is a bit of a blow, really. Uh, considering he was just treated as a precaution last week. So he's not fit. Torrey out as well. Santa not ready. So, yeah, Villa squad not really shaping up. It's not really at full strength at the moment. So, need a few players to come back from injury and hopefully they can get a win tomorrow, get the international break um, to get them back and hopefully kick on then, starting at Chelsea in September. So, yeah, um, transfers, we spoke about that. Dees was quite happy with what he's got. He wants to promote the youth after they're, they're, they're showing a barrow in the week. He doesn't want to block their pathways. So, um, big chance for them. Big vote of confidence in them. Like uh, Chuck Mawika, Villagin Badois, Cameron Archer in the week as well. So, I expect them to be involved tomorrow against Brentford. A um, couple of outgoings. Wesley is in uh, Bru uh, Bruges at the moment, having a medical. So, we have a season-long loan there, try and get his career back on track after that horror injury. I see Conor Horahan heading out as well in similar fashion. He wants minutes. Um, he's not going to get them at Villa. In a, in a first team, first team Premier League shirt. So, yeah, a couple of outgoings. There might be maybe a surprise on the deadline day. There always is, but as it stands, Dees is happy with his squad. He just wants them at the treatment table to, to come back and, and and return, basically. So, wait and see. Billy, what have you made of Villa? Kind of looking on from afar. I know that you've always got a watchful eye over over Villa with, with Smith being there. Um, what have you made of them? And, and also from the Brentford perspective. We we look at it as an outsider and think they lose best their best players and seem to overcome and adapt and, and are always fine. Lost Dean Smith and Thomas Frank comes in and gets them promoted and, and still look fine and look look good. So how have you assessed Villa in, in Smith's time since he left you and post Smith at Brentford? How have you kept ticking along? I mean the first thing I want to say is Dean Smith, brilliant bloke. You know, I know know Dean Smith really well. Obviously for Brentford we chat to him a lot and he's a top, top bloke. And and when he went, you know, we were a bit gutted because it was a the day after Lee, we played Leeds, we had beaten, actually, no, we didn't beat, we almost beat Leeds United up at, up at, up at Leeds. And, uh, yeah, it was the day after that. And, uh, and we were, we were, we were, we were looking good to go up that season. And I was a bit gutted and, you know, and, and, and he left us, but we sent him, you know, we went to Villa, you know, with, with you know, good wishes from B's fans, good wishes from us. And I actually saw him, the last time I actually saw Dean actually was at Wembley when you played Derby County in the playoff final, because I actually went to that game. Actually, I, I went to that playoff final and the playoff semi final because I was actually shooting some stuff, some some fan content stuff for for Sky Sky TV. So some of your Villa fans might have seen me running, mm. scuttling between the Villa <laughs> end and the and the West Brom end. Like you know, it was, it was quite well, it was quite bad. I was I had to basically film everything, you know, from the terraces. I put it together. Actually, I might send you a link and put that up because actually it was a brilliant, brilliant movie. I had a really, really, really good time as well at the the West Brom game. That's the second leg game. And I did about 10 miles, right, running between the Villa <laughs> end and the West Brom end, like just filming bits and pieces. I've got all the goals, I've got the crowd reaction. I saw all sort of kind of chums down there as well, like, you know. Um, I, I, I think I saw you guys down there as well, like, you know. Yeah. Um, I think you were down there. Yeah, I saw a lot of people. But anyway, um, so so that was kind of like the last time I've seen Villa in the flesh, seen the Villa fans, the atmosphere in the ground. That was really great. Like I said, that semi-final against West Brom and the, and the final against Derby County. And seeing Dean Swift there. So since then, you've gone up Premier League. Obviously, um, the, the the first season you you weren't that great. And I I have to admit, I didn't see you that much the first season because when you when you're in the Championship, I mean, I don't watch top. I don't watch match of the day. I literally I've got no interest in watching match of the day. So I never watch match of the day. And uh, so I didn't really see you that much. We just know that, that you were struggling a bit, and you you kind of got off via Hawkeye on the last game of the season. Oh, right? That's the one thing that we do know. Um, so Hawkeye. It must have been your substitute, like you know, a spare substitute that came off the bench at the last minute and saved you. So, um, so there's that. But the following season, we were actually looking at you quite a bit because a lot of Brentford fans, because the, the love for Ollie Watkins, who again he went to Villa with our blessing as well. Like, you know, people think that's a really strange thing. Why do you keep sending your players, selling your players and get rid of them and, and blessing them? But it's like, listen, we've got a system and we're a small club and we know it. And we, if we get rid of people, we have to. And if we replace them right, then we do. And that's what the, the coaches do. So Ollie Watkins came to Villa. So a lot of Brentford fans actually started to have a look at Villa to see what they were doing. And we saw the Liverpool game when you bashed them up, like, you know, and stuff like that. And people were nodding their heads going, yeah, go there, Villa. Go there, Ollie. Like, you know, so uh, I think that you had a good season and also you're playing some good football. I'm 
met Tyrone Mings. I'm a big England fan, so I've been all over the place, 15 tournaments with them. So with my daughter, I met him up at the England training ground at St. George's as well. And he's a really, really nice bloke as well. So um, and, and the thing is that obviously Brentford and Villa being in different different leagues as well, you could just kind of take two steps back. So I thought you had a really, really, uh, a really good season. I think um, Dean Smith stepped it up a couple of gears. In the fact that he was very much on a learning curve with Brentford, he did make mm. a lot of mistakes. But you know, you expect people on that learning curve to make mistakes. You can't get it right all the all the time, and that's why I think that people who just you know, if, if a manager comes in and doesn't do the right thing straight away, people want him sacked straight away. I think that's wrong. Like you know, and I know Dean Smith's come up under a lot of grief from some sections of the Villa crowd, and I think that's wrong. You know, he he had he had that going on at Brentford because he was seen as a streaky manager where he went on long streaks of being unbeaten, then he went on long streaks of being beaten, then it kept on flipping to and fro. But you know, when you spoke to the owner and you said to him, you know, what's going on? He said, leave him. He knows what he's doing. We're doing the right things. We've got young players. It's going to take them time to develop, and eventually it started to come good. So with Dean Smith, you know, I think he's stepped up a couple of gears and he's learned but also he had thomas frank coming in sort of kind of helping him and learning and and, and helping him you know uh, you know underneath so the fact that thomas frank has now stepped in to be the top don at brentford dean smith has gone on and obviously taken some of the things he's learned and done premier league business i i'm i'm, I'm really happy for him you know what i'm saying i'm really happy for him listen it's football I'm, I'm actually just really happy that fans are back in the stadium. Listen, wh whoever they may be, you know, from Accrington, Stanley to Aston Villa to Brentford. Listen, that's that's what that's all that really matters as well. So you're watching decent football. We're watching decent football. We're going to have a play game tomorrow. I hope we win. You hope you win. Whatever <laughs> happens, it happens, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Nice way of looking at it. Uh, Ash, from our perspective, what kind of lineup are you expecting Villa to go with, and uh, how do we beat Brentford? Essentially, if you were boss, what would you be doing? So unchanged, obviously, can't change a winning team, really, Dan. Um, we've got to available. We're going to chuck Watkins straight back in. Did he pass his fitness test? And just means changing the shape. And mm. I mean, going back to the drawing board in, in terms of a system. So I think he's stick with what he's got. I think it's a big, big afternoon for Emmy Bruin there after his um, bit of a disappointing show last week against Newcastle. F full, full week on the training pitch for him. We're doing a world of good. £38 million pound player there. Um, so hopefully he can come good tomorrow. Yeah, Al Ghazi, he's got um, seven goals in his last 10 games for Villa, so he's on a bit of a streak. Um, so that'll be the forward line with Danny Ings up top. And Sam again, I think. I think McGinn will play. Douglas Louise, Jacob Ramsey, fresh from uh, his uh, under-21 call-up as well. And same back five in place with Ashley Young keeping Matt Target out. So, so yeah, um, yeah I mean, same again for Villa. Um, in terms of Brentford, I'm a bit concerned about them three centre-halves, dominant Big, 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 uh, big defenders, um, dominant, dominant in the air, and whether Denning can get any joy out of them. That, that, that's my, my issue there. Um, mm. With that, I mean, really imposing figures. They are Pinnock, uh, Aya, and, and Pontus Janssen. We all know about Pontus Janssen as well. So hopefully, we get some change out of them. Um, and yeah, that, that'll be the way to go. And yeah, we'll see, we'll see what plays out. I think set pieces could be big again for Villa, obviously from two last week so whether they can do that again I'm not so sure but I just wanted to ask Billy about uh, um, Deesby's time at Brentford I mean you mentioned a streaky manager there uh, he has been that uh, Villa at, at times as well obviously went on that 10, ten game winning run and, and then last season as well when Grealish come out of the team we were, were pretty poor really and then mm. we picked up that back end of the season so I mean how, how, how is Dean rated there I mean just under just under three years at, at Griffin Park I Listen. mean Listen, I think you know he's a good manager, and I think that if he stayed, he would have, he would have got us up most definitely. Also, yeah. as you see, Brentford is a, is a club that's got patience, so yeah. they've got patience, and if they believe that you're doing the right thing, they'll stick with you. So Dean Smith, if it took another year, another two years, you know, and he was actually kind of moving forward the whole time, they would have stuck with him, and that's the way that we are. You now we're, we're we're proper long term plan mm. football club, so. I think that initially when there was a when we started to sort of kind of change our whole system and what we were doing and we got you know Mark Warburton left because he he wasn't really basically he wasn't really Brentford he wasn't he didn't have his art in he didn't believe in what we were doing you yeah. know so he was off doing that thing over there and we were kind of going trying to go over there and he was just like listen it's got it's got to be my way or the highway so Mark when Mark Warburton left and then it changed to having lots of people within the club who were all shooting in the same direction that's when you noticed it started to get better because you you really need to say this is the ethos this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to play this is how we're going to do it this is the person who's going to do it now let's get on with it and that's what they did with dean smith and like i said to start off with his first job actually to be fair when he came in because after warburton left 
he um um, the, I think the club tried so hard to kind of almost be anti Warburton, they kind of changed everything. So they got a manager who was like almost like completely the antithesis, a guy called Dykhausen from Holland, who mm. came for this tiny little team in Holland, right? And I'm saying, and then we signed about 15 or 16 players. We just signed all these players from everywhere. And that season, we realized that the players didn't gel and they came over and they were homesick and they didn't quite understand the UK and the game and the championship. And it was a bit of a nightmare. And then we had the old school guard, you know, like the sort of John, like, like, like John Terry was with England, like, you know, yeah. this, is our, this is our dressing room, like, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> the old school guard and then the new still coming in. And Dean Smith came in and basically after Dykhausen went, Dean Smith came in and his main job was just to sort out the mess. Mm. So I think the owner said, look, just sort them out. So he had to sort of sort out to get a harmonious dressing room going on to get the players through, get the young players through, kind of eventually kind of shift out the older school guard and just make it nice. So that, he probably spent a year and a half doing that and he didn't complain. He just zipped his mouth, got in with the job and did that. He was getting a bit of grief from the fans because at time we were doing the streaky run thing, but his job was really to kind of sort out Brent because it was slightly in a bit of a mess. Um, and then by the time the second season came, the season when you got relegated, then you played us, you bought Scott Hogan, you know. Yeah. So I remember he sort of scored Hot Hogan, and then you came down to us and we beat you 3 0. I think yeah, it was on that day, which shocked off. you, like, it kind of shocked us a bit as well because we just we just sold Hogan. We were like, oh, boy, 12 million, you can have him for 12 million, we'll, we'll still beat you. So then that, <laughs> and by that stage, he'd he kind of got on and understood what was happening, and then he started to get better and better. So with Dean Smith, he's really humble. He's really learning. I think the thing that frustrated him, and he didn't sort of say at the time, but he kind of sort of like hinted at me, is that he was frustrated at the time when when it looked like he was getting to a level, then we had to sell a player. So, you know, with Scott Hogan, and then he was getting to a level, then he had to sell a player. And then the next player came, it's like, you know, Neil Malpe. I don't know if he was, I might be there before Malpe, but he always had to sell a player, you know, a, a, a decent player. And then all of a sudden he found himself kind of had to step down a little bit mm -hmm. and train the next player up. But I think as a, as a manager... He understood the system and he loved it, but it was frustrating him. So I think when he went to Villa, you know, not be funny, you had Jack Grealish, who was probably on about £300 million pounds a week, you know, yeah. at the time, but you kept hold of him somehow. And uh, he just said, you know, it's different here. You know, it's different. You didn't necessarily have to do that, even though you did run into a bit of FFP problems, but we won't talk about that. But he's like going, you know, we've kind of stuck with our guns here. So it's allowed him to build. So maybe that's the reason why you've got a little bit bit faster at Aston Villa, and you took a bit of risks at the same time, but enabled him to do it to do his thing. So for Dean Smith, you know, he, honestly, he's a really top bloke, and he, and he's a really nice guy. Him, him and Richard O'Kelly were really tight. I mean, they literally they were inseparable. So the fact that they've kind of split up for me is a bit of a strange one because mm. Richard O'Kelly was actually he was like the um the, I want to say the granddad, but he was like the kind of person where the players if they had issues they come into his office and sit down and he'd talk them through and he'd listen yeah. to them. And there was like a real homely thing going on. So it kind of worked with him being there, being the listener and the, the shoulder to, to if you have any problems like, you know, and they really, really trusted him. So I was, I was quite surprised when he left, you know, obviously for his own personal reasons, he's gone, but them two mm. definitely came, came as a, came, came as, came as a pair, like, you know, but, you know, talking about Aston Villa, you know, in your team, I mean, I'm looking at the players that you've got, and you talked about that. Emi Brendia, obviously, he was in our he was in our league last season, and some people rated him as the best player in the league. Uh, he's a good player, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, obviously, I'd say you know people like Ben Rama and people like that the season before. I think they were, they were great players, sort of kind of very good creative players. But the one thing that you noticed when he played for Norwich City last season, when he didn't play for Norwich, Norwich were terrible. They were like nothing, you know. So he was like the creative core to that Norwich team and he really did make them happen and he was out for quite a few games one time and I think they never got beaten or they just didn't play very well and they were quite worried actually but when he came yeah. back you know they kind of sort of kind of motored up so it's almost like Norwich and again it's not disrespect to them but they may have been a team who were probably slightly highly weighted on one player now it'll be interesting to see how he fits in and how he does within the Aston Villa team because obviously he he's got a lot of other good players around him so it's a yeah. case of like not giving it to Ben Dia and him just going off and doing his thing, like seeing how he actually works and plays with the other players and will, will there be a misbalance in your side or will he actually work and fit in? So that's going to be a, that's going to be a really interesting one as well. Um, you know, other than, other than that, we were you know, we were talking about, we, we do a podcast, Besotted Podcast, Pride of West dot London. If you want to check it out, like I said to you, it's, uh, it's, it's live now actually, Pride of West dot London. And I know you guys are, you're on there as well. Dan's on the podcast there. And we talked about the Villa game 
and we talked about where we might be able to hit the Villa lot because, you know, where we play, we've got the three at the back and we play with the wing backs. That's very much how we've flipped our game fairly recently uh, for a number of different reasons. We flipped flipped that back in the last season with the fourth. Four, three, three wasn't working for us. So we flipped to three at the back. So we've got the wing back thing going on and we know it's at Villa slightly weak in, uh, in, in being hit on the break. So, uh, and this is this is one area that we're actually very good at. I'm not saying, you know, we're going to smash Villa because of it or any other team, but obviously you've got to kind of look at other teams' weaknesses. So that, it's going to be interesting to see how um, Sergi Canos, who you know Sergi Canos from the championship days as mm-hmm. our left winger, all of a sudden he's popped in now at the right wing back. So uh, that's quite interesting. Him at right wing back, Rico Henry at left wing back, and uh, they are rapid. When we get the ball and we work it out from defence, they are rapid. So that's interesting. And also the other thing is like Matty Target, um, I mean, Matty, is it Matty Cash? Cash is a brilliant player. Player of the season, team, what, two seasons ago for Nottingham Forest. Brilliant player. Brilliant. Honestly, fantastic player. So he's, he's, I don't see him giving us much change, but it'll be interesting to go to see what Target's going to do down that side because, uh, you know, I, I think maybe they might be targeting Target a little bit because uh, I know that he's he's had a few interesting moments. I think probably the thing's going to be saved. I mean, you might be able to tell me more than more than I am, but um, but it'll be interesting. Listen, you could tell how excited I am. For us, we're just happy to be here. We're happy to be coming to Villa again. Going to go to your pubs before and have a bit of a laugh, and we'll just see how it do. There's there's no pressure on us, and that's what I quite like in this league because after having the rise that we did over the last three or four years or five years in the Championship. All of a sudden, we got to the season where people were going, oh, Brentford, oh, yeah, they're going to be top six, they're going to be top two, or oh, they should go up. It's like, oh, no, this is very un-Brentford. People are actually sort of rating us, whereas before, they used to take the pee out of us the whole time. <laughs> so, actually, people are actually expecting us to get promoted and, and, and do stuff. And when we didn't do it, they're going, oh, disappointed in Brentford. So, we actually like being in the champions, in the Premier League now, where no one rates us at all, and everyone expects <laughs> us to get relegated because that's what we're used to, like, you know? So, no pressure, as they say. Just going back to our team, Ash, and it might be uh, Ashley Young still slotting at left back rather than target. Um, there's rumours today on social media about John McGinn potentially having COVID. I don't know where this is coming from. I think it's up in the Scotland end, even though he's been selected in the national team. Smith would have mentioned this, wouldn't he? I would have thought in the press of today there was no mention of McGinn, as far as I'm aware. No, uh, the club don't want to. It's probably not commenting on any individual COVID cases at the moment, so we can't. We can't speculate otherwise so as it stands McGinn plays we'll find out tomorrow two o'clock when the team sheet's filed if he's struggling with COVID or, or not so yeah club don't want to comment on any any rumours or any, any individual cases of COVID at the moment and it's as you were um, If he is how much of a blow is that because he's looked back to his best this season so far hasn't he? He has yeah he was very good last week um, yeah. mid- midfield and area we're looking to get, get a Brentford tomorrow and yeah, he's been, he's been massive. Jacob Ramsey was good last week as well, and Douglas Louise. So Villa, I think Villa play three in there, try and control it in there again. And um, we'll see what they got. I just want to ask Billy about the, 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 the transfers and how Brentford deal with the transfers. Obviously, Dean Smith said last week he's looking to place uh, O'Kelly with someone, someone like Thomas Frank, who he, who he hired back in December 2016, I think, from Copenhagen. Bromby, sorry. Um, there's a big backroom staff, isn't there, at Brentford in terms of recruitment wise? You've got yeah. a couple of. Um, uh, directors of football and and stat- uh, tacticians and stuff like that. So, how does that work? I mean, you look at Mopai, yeah, but, Ben Brahma, and then them. Yeah. Then, so, how's yeah, it all work? But, yeah, but, but again, this whole system and and, and it's it's sort of t- not so takes time to, to understand, but. You know, I keep harking back to because the Warburton days, basically Warburton wanted it old school. It's like it was me yeah. and my people. Yeah. Whereas the owner, because he, the owner is he's a Brentford fan. I mean, he used to go to Brentford back in the day, bunk off school to go to like, I think it was Nottingham Forest or something like that on the train, like back back in the like 80s when Nottingham Forest had actually actually won the, the, the European Cup. Like the, back, mm. back in those days, the owner used to go to Brentford. So he's not like a Johnny come lately at all. Left, but was clever, started to empty of a bank, you know, started to get into stats. He basically has got this whole um, system where he's built this this statistical model yeah. where, in effect, what they do is that you, you you hone information from all around the world on sports games. And, and for us, it'll be football, or it could be any sports games. And he uses it to basically, in effect, fund, fund a, sort of a, a gambling um, uh, a company that he's got because he believes in the numbers. So, you know, his, 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 his theory will be, like, you know, if you've got 10 numbers, you know, if you just go and you go for this se- seven out of times, it'll come in at this number. So at the end of the day, you just basically, if you believe in the numbers, 
this is what you do because eventually it'll come in seven times out of ten and he really does believe in that so he's used this same system to the best way to describe it is that when you're going to scouting players you can either get somebody to get in his car and travel up to Accrington Stanley and to Cardiff and here and there and everywhere and spend a lot of time seeing players who half the time they're not very good yeah. Or you can find a system which basically uses the numbers to find certain things about these players and sift out the nonsense, right? So all of a sudden, you know, instead of somebody having to have gone in their car 100 times to find a decent player, this system would have sifted out the best 20. And all mm. of a sudden, then that scout could go around and check out the best 20 and then go, actually, tell you something, that person's good or that person, oh, he's got a bit of an attitude. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how our system has worked. And it's come from the owner's kind of business that he's got and, and and he's got PhDs and all sorts doing that. So that's how we end up finding players like, you know, Andre Gray and, and Scott Hogan and, 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 you know, Malpay and, you know, it, it, even people sort of say people like, you know, uh, 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 Ivan Tony and they say, Oh yeah, we all know about Ivan Tony. Well, if you knew about him, why did no one buy him? You know, <laughs> and then the team saying, it's like, yeah, you all know about him after he scored 32, 31 goals. <laughs> but he was fifth, he was five million, he was five million pounds. We got him for five million pounds, right? You know what I'm okay. saying? So, what I'm saying is that we we said basically he came and they look at the system and it pings all the all the all the, the figures that they have pings really high. And they think what we need to do is we need to do X, Y, and Z. We need to maybe scrub him up a little bit. It might take him six months or a year or whatever it may be to get better. And that's how we do with all our players. You know, same thing with Neil Malpay, who started off slowly, started off with Vibe, started off slowly. Scott Hogan didn't actually start very slowly at all, to be quite honest with you. But he, we played the system right for him. When he came to Villa, you play the wrong system for him. And mm. that's why he never he never worked. And then he, yeah. then he got unfit and then he just couldn't score any goals at all. Like, you know, so, you know, that's the whole thing with Brentford. And it's really really work for us and not only for the strikers it's for the defenders for the wingers for everybody um okay of course it hasn't worked 100 percent. we've had players that have come in and they haven't worked but what happens is that Brentford also has to take a risk because you have to remember that we're, we're not spending a lot of money relatively you know sometimes we we're buying players for 500,000 800,000 million 1.2 million but probably 80 percent of the players that come in have worked in some way either they've gone on to bigger and better things or if they haven't worked with us we've still managed to sell them on so we bought a player for 500 grand as a bit of a risk he hasn't worked with us but then we, we've ended up selling for three million you know so yeah. for Brentford that's still a win because you've you you're, you're doing something with that so that's kind of how it works with us with with, with with actually finding players and with the fans initially when we did it we said we're going to sell Andre Gray fans were really 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 disappointed you know what I'm saying because Andre Gray was brilliant for us scored 18 goals we got to the playoff semi-final in the you know in the championship and all of a sudden the following summer you know we're going to sell him and they're like you can't do that and everyone went mad and the Brentford said, don't worry, we'll get someone better. And then next, like, and then next Scott Hogan came on. We we're like, oh, okay. Then and he scored a lot of goals. And then all of a sudden we we're going to sell him to you. And the fans were like, no, you can't do that. And Brentford were like, don't worry, we'll get someone better. And they kept on doing it every time. But Watkins. every time they did it, the fans calmed down a little bit until eventually, like, you know, when they sort of said, we're going to sell Ollie, Wat Ollie Watkins, they're like, oh, bye, see you later. <laughs> we'll send you some presents, like, you know. So we've got used to the system of Brentford unfortunately and as a fan i don't want to sell any players but we got used to it because we're a small club and we have to fund you know we have to fund we, we can't go around selling stadiums and doing things that other clubs do we, we don't operate like that we have to operate within our our means so we have to do that so this closed season you know we've um it's been an interesting one because obviously you know i mean before that ivan tony for five million was like whoa and brian and boomo for six million euros was like whoa that's loads of money you know that we spent the seasons before but this season you know we've gone straight in and bought IF from celtic from 13.5 million pounds which is like oh geez i'd never think brentford would buy a player for that money like you know and then we've got sort of frank the tank on yeka who's this midfielder <laughs> we've got from fc michelin which is matthew benham the owner's his um sister club in denmark yeah. and he bought them when they were like shaking buckets pretty much outside the club and within two years he applied the same statistical system to them and uh, they won the league <laughs> and then the champions league so you know he kind of sort of realized this kind of stuff works so we bought frank the tank mm. from uh from yeka from then um, for 8.5 million and he is already a crowd favorite i mean he just doesn't stop like 90 minutes of just steaming around and pressing people and tackling and just doing all sorts so you know we've got him on the on the field who, who's really really exciting as well you know like i said i we've got this guy visa who probably won't feature on saturday he'll probably come off the wing very fast we're going to be paid 10 million for him apparently as well um from uh, said we bought him from lorient 
which uh, we do laugh because we bought it from Lorient, France, where we're normally used to playing players from Lorient, which is Leighton Orient, like, you know what I mean? So, uh, mm. so yeah, so we've got him as well, which we've got this season. So we've got a few players that we've got, you know, we've got in the mix. We've got a new goalkeeper, which we've got on the bench as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's, like I said to you, it's quite, it's quite exciting for us at the moment now because we're having to play with a bigger pot of money. So beforehand, yeah. you know, two, three million, four million. Now we're playing with eight, 10, 12 million pounds for our kind of record signing buyers, which I know compared to other teams, that's small fry. You know, the other teams are playing 30 and 40 million for players. You know, we're not going to go that high, but it is nosebleed territory for Brentford paying this kind of money. But the players so far seem to be quite quality. Um, so we'll have to see how that comes off. Because listen, we, we're under no illusion. This Premier League is hard. And we're not going to say that we're going to do the business, but... We're giving it a go, and also we're going to continue to play decent football, and and that's what make, that makes us very proud as 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 Bees fans. I want to end with a, a score prediction from you both. I'm just going to read off my notes: six games against Brentford since 2016, three defeats for Villa, and three draws. Interestingly, though, all the the defeats came away from home. All the draws at Villa Park: one one, three nil, nil nil, two one, two two, one nil. So based off that, we're also up for a score draw at Villa Park tomorrow. Ash, I'll start with you. Saturday, three o'clock for the second time in a row. Who's going to win? Or will it be a draw? <laughs> well, I fancy, I fancy Tony, Tony to score for Brentford. You don't go too many games without a goal. So I think I fancy him to score. Just typical Villa. Players seem to break the ducks against Villa. So I think Tony yeah. might only get off the mark. Hopefully Villa, yeah, Villa win. I'm going to predict a last time. I'll get, I'll get slated. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh, yeah. Um, so I'm back in the Holton tomorrow. I'm taking my old man down as well. So I'm off work. Oh, lovely. So I'm back amongst it. Um, Dad's birthday treat. So yeah, day off work. So I have to be frantically writing the match reports and the whistle and this, that, and the other. So I can enjoy it tomorrow. Um, I hope Billy has a good day as well. All the Brentford fans. Um, yeah, it should be a great atmosphere. Nothing like a soul at Villa Park. Um, mm. But yeah, I'll go. I've got two one. Villa sneak it again. And um, I've got fancy Tony to score probably first, and then hopefully the Villa fight back. Yeah, I'm going 2-1 as well. I said exactly the same last week and it was a 2-0, but I do think we'll concede this weekend. The reality is that I'd be absolutely delighted with a draw because I said on the podcast as well that this, I believe, is going to be our hardest of the three games so far. You know, Villa, Villa played football on the floor. They've played us before. You are, and this is not a disrespect to you, you are a championship club. In fact, you've come from the championship, so you know what to expect of us and expect of teams like us. And you've been down there knowing what a battle it is in the championship to, to, you know, whereas when we played Arsenal, you know, the Arsenal fans were moaning because, like, they said that the noise in the stadium was too much for the, for the players, you know, and our players were kind of beating them up. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of, what are you talking about? Like, you know, we were just playing football and we were playing to our strength. So I think that Villa know us a lot better, obviously, than, than Arsenal do. And you'll be able to combat that um, better, you know, um, with, with Dean Smith. So uh, I'm looking, like I said, I'm looking forward to coming up. You know, there's all sorts of Villa, you know, characters like, you know, the Sutton Coalfield uh, crew who take a coach every time, like, you know what I'm saying, with uh, Hatch yeah, and yeah. that, you know, yeah. and Kev, his cousin and all those people. So I might pop in and see them for a quick drink beforehand. Uh, and then I'm up to pop out quickly if they realise that my score prediction is one nil. But I'm going to say for you guys, let's, I'll be happy with a draw. Okay, I'll be happy with a one all draw. But if we can nick it one will, that'd be that'd be really good because that's another three points closer to safety in this yeah. league, and that, that's what we need, as you said. Lovely stuff, then, gents. We'll call it a day there. Thanks very much, Billy, for coming on the podcast. I do appreciate it, uh, Ash. Thank you as always for your time and enjoy your weekend off. The first for a long while, I'd have thought. So yeah, enjoy that with your old man. Uh, we'll be back. I think we'll be doing something after the game tomorrow night, but it won't be you because you're off. Um, so it'll probably be me and Matt having a quick chat at the end of the game. And then we'll do a full kind of debrief on Monday, uh, as we always do. So thanks very much for tuning in to the Claret Blue podcast. We'll see you on Saturday and then again on Monday. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue and Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. But until then, up the villa. Up the villa.